All across Mexico and in the US state of Texas, there is a thing. In Texas, it is known as the Owl Witch. In Mexico, it is called La Lechuza, the Owl in English. They hold a prominent place in Hispanic legend and have equivalents all across the world. The Harpies of ancient Greece and the Banshee of ancient Celtic legend are two such examples. La Lechuza, the Owl Witch, is just as terrifying. There are several theories about what exactly the Owl Witch is. The first version of the story tells of a woman who practiced witchcraft many centuries ago. Naturally, the other locals in her small Mexican community weren't thrilled about this. They murdered her, but that didn't mean that they were rid of her. Her spirit returned in the form of an owl-woman hybrid to get revenge. Murdered individuals often come back in spirit form with animal-like features. A notable example of this phenomenon is the Rat Man of South End, England, which is said to be the spirit of a homeless man who was beaten to death one rainy night by a group of sadistic teenagers. When he came back as an angry spirit, he had gained rodent-like attributes and taken on the appearance of a half-rat, half-man hybrid. The Owl Witch could have gained her powers and appearance from the same otherworldly force that brought the Rat Man back to life. Another version of the story states that La Lechuza are women who, possessed by an uncontrollable desire to gain magical powers, made the oldest deal in the world to gain them. They sold their souls to the devil. At night, they transform into monsters with a bird's body and a woman's face. They then fly across the night sky, searching for the prey that they desperately need in order to continue on with their incredible powers, human prey. When she finds a suitable target, she will perch in a location where she can't be seen, and then, like other predatory cryptids such as the Arwizot and the Crocata, she will make noises which act as bait for her prey, most notably the sound of an infant crying. Anyone who attempts to investigate is likely to become La Lechuza's next meal. The creature will then, like the owl she gets her name from, swoop down and grab a hold of her unfortunate prey. She then carries the confused and terrified Good Samaritan back to her nest, where she pins them down and pecks away at them, tearing them apart slowly until they eventually succumb to their injuries and blood loss, and die. In modern times, most reported run-ins with the Owl Witch involve her swooping down at cars driving along deserted roads at night. They are said to be able to withstand gunfire and are possibly immortal. As a witch, Lechuza possesses supernatural powers. This also means that they operate according to different physical laws than what we humans do. They are said to be able to summon thunderstorms, and sightings of the Owl Witch are believed to coincide with them. This could be the case, as some believe, while others believe that the Lechuza simply appears during thunderstorms as it would act as a cover while hunting. We must remember that she is not bound by the needs of regular creatures, and so flying through dangerous weather would pose little to no risk to her. There are, however, two things that do pose a risk to this creature. The Owl Witch, first of all, fears salt. This is possibly due to her gaining her powers from the Devil. If she possesses some of the Devil's powers, then she may possess his weaknesses too. If you spill salt on the dinner table, gathering it up with your hand and throwing it over your left shoulder is said to blind the Devil as he stands behind you. It could be, for this reason, that the Owl Witch too fears being burned and blinded by salt. The second weapon you can use against the Lechuza, interestingly, is swear words. Upon hearing the call of a Lechuza, the best thing to do is to immediately begin cursing her and shouting the most obscene words you can think of in her direction. Doing so will drive her away. Whatever you do, do not go outside to investigate the sound of a baby crying. 
As much as it may pain you to swear at a baby, this may be the best course of action if that baby happens to be crying outside of your house in the dead of night. Rather frightening stuff, wouldn't you agree, Traveller? The Owl Witch, or La Lechuza, is a cryptid you should always be on the lookout for if you happen to live in Mexico or the state of Texas. Chessie is said to live in the midst of the Chesapeake Bay, located in between Virginia and Maryland, USA. Most sightings describe the creature as a long, snake-like sea serpent, from anywhere between 25 and 40 feet long. Unlike other similar cryptid sightings, such as Nessie or Champ, Chessie possesses no flippers or limbs whatsoever, but is instead said to more closely resemble a giant eel or a sea snake, and is reported to be black or brown in colour. The earliest sighting of the creature is said to have taken place in 1936. Something reptilian and unknown in the water was observed by a crew of military personnel. According to Matt Lake in the Weird Maryland Traveller's Guide, two fishermen, Francis Klarman and Edward J. Ward, had spotted something in the water near Baltimore in 1943. One of the men said, This thing was about 75 yards away, at right angles from our boat. At first, it looked like something floating on the water. It was black, and the part of it that was out of the water seemed about 12 feet long. It has a head about as big as a football, and shaped somewhat like a horse's head. It turned its head around several times, almost all the way round. In 1978, witnesses claimed to have seen Chessie near southern Maryland's Calvert Cliffs State Park and in the Potomac River in Westmoreland County, Virginia. A sighting in 1980 by boater Trudy Guthrie was published by the Evening Sun, it was later identified as a manatee from Florida. Manatees are occasionally sighted in the area. In 1982, Robert and Karen Frew captured Chessie on film near Kent Island. Their footage shows a brownish object moving side to side like an aquatic snake. In 1994, a manatee that was rescued from Chesapeake's cold water was nicknamed Chessie after the monster before being returned to Florida. Another sighting occurred in 1997 off the shore of Fort Smallwood Park, very close to the shore. And the most recent occurred on the morning of the 5th of April 2014. While parked on the side of Arundel Beach Road, directly next to the Magothy River, when the tide was really high, a Maryland resident and his friend were said to have seen Chessie less than five feet away from his car. He described it as a snake-like creature, about 25 to 30 feet in length, without fins, topped with a slender head and black in colour, although he could not tell if it had scales or leathery skin. The creature did not rise out of the water, but the head and tail end just breached the surface as it moved with a serpentine motion. The witness first questioned himself if it could have been two separate animals travelling behind one another, but soon realised that it was one creature because of the pattern it created on the water's surface. Although no photo was obtained, as the witness said he was so busy trying to figure out what the hell he was looking at, that in the moment, he did not think to take a picture with his phone. The witness was so moved that he called the Maryland Department of Natural Resources soon after the sighting. There is also this photograph taken recently, seemingly replicating the famous Surgeon's Photograph of 1934, but instantly betrayed by its more modern, high-definition capture as being nothing more than a child's toy. Chessie has become somewhat of an icon for the Chesapeake Bay, and was used by the US Fish and Wildlife Service for its educational colouring book in 1986, Chessie, a Chesapeake Bay story. The book focuses on the Chesapeake Bay and protecting its resources. A second colouring book, Chessie Returns, was published in 1991. These, along with later illustrations of the monster in newspapers, government publications and articles, gave the monster a more friendly appearance, in line with their attempts to bring awareness to the issue of pollution in the bay. 
As you can see, there seems to be more and more ancient aquatic reptiles witnessed across the world by the year. With less known about our own oceans than the surface of the moon, there are no doubt hundreds, if not thousands, of undocumented species yet to be discovered. Could the monster of Chesapeake Bay be among them? Dinosaurs The dominant life forms of planet Earth for over 170 million years, before going extinct at the end of the Cretaceous period 65 million years ago. Or so we think. Numerous sightings of dinosaur-like creatures have been reported by people across the world. One such creature is the Kassai Rex. The Kassai Rex is native to the jungles of the Kassai Valley in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It is speculated to be a surviving species of theropod dinosaur, such as the Tyrannosaurus or Giganotosaurus. Although, if it is indeed a surviving African theropod, then it would be more likely a species of Spinosaur, Allosaur, or a Carcharodontosaur, as there have been no Tyrannosaurid remains discovered in Africa as of yet. Other depictions describe the beast as a species of gigantic monitor lizard, or a terrestrial crocodile. In 1932, an experienced Swedish hunter, John Johnson, wanted to hunt elephants. He and his servant left their camp, crossing a swamp and finally reaching the savannah in the Kassai Valley, which seemed desolate as there were no animals anywhere. Until the servant yelled in excitement after spotting some elephants. Johnson got his gun ready, but something was wrong. There were only two elephants instead of an entire herd. About 44 metres away, something in the underbrush was stalking the elephants. Suddenly, a strange creature jumped out of the brush. The servant fled while Johnson, paralysed, changed aim and shot at the creature. He fired three times, with only one shot finding its mark. The creature backed off and retreated. Johnson and his servant regrouped and decided to go back to the camp, but first they had to cross the swamp. They were halfway through when they heard a splash. Thinking of crocodiles, Johnson looked everywhere until they saw 22 metres away the same creature that they saw in the savannah devouring a freshly killed rhinoceros. Johnson's servant ran away terrified while he stayed still. He immediately thought of shooting the creature but was terrified when he realised the servant was holding his shotgun. But John still had his camera, so he took a photo of the creature, which, upon hearing the click, sank quickly into the lake. Upon his return, John described what he saw. It was reddish-brown in colour, with blackish coloured stripes, he said. It had a long snout and numerous teeth. He decided that the creature, 13 metres long, must have been a Tyrannosaurus, and also said, the legs were thick, it reminded me of a lion built for speed. In 1933, a group made up of five hunters went to the Kassai Valley to hunt the creature called the Kassai Rex by the newspaper Rhodesia Herald, which they thought was a giant crocodile and that they would hunt it to sell the skin at a good price. They arrived in the Kassai Valley and passed through the same swamp where Johnson had passed the previous year. One of the hunters was frightened to see a huge tail sink into the lake. They initially thought it was so big, it must be an anaconda. They readied their weapons, but were surprised by a wave of water that fell on them from the left side. The tail had left the marsh violently and hit one of the hunters, who fell into the water. The other four began to fire into the water, seeing nothing but waves that dispersed throughout the surface. The creature, however, disappeared. The group managed to hide themselves, and in the end, they left. In 1950, Robert Henderson, a great hunter and expert zoologist, had thought about making a trip to the jungles of the Congo to find exotic and never-before-discovered species. A year later, in August 1951, Henderson made his trip to the Kassai Valley, passing by the Kassai River. He was aided by a group of locals. The safari was expected to last about six days, and they would camp so that Henderson would have enough time to hunt. 
However, after the sixth day had passed, no one saw the men return, so they waited a little longer, thinking they hadn't come back yet because it had been raining, causing the river to rise. Some time had passed, and still no sign of them, so a search party consisting of ten people from the village and five people from the military regiment set out to find them. The next day, they found traces of a camp, seeming to be the initial base of Robert and his group. The rescuers estimated that they were there for about two days. It was thought that Henderson had gone to the depths of the Kasai Valley to hunt something else, since they had already found gazelle skin and viscera close by. Continuing on, the valley strangely seemed desolate, with no signs of life anywhere, but after having walked several kilometres, they found the remains of Robert and his group. They had found a temporary camp, which was completely destroyed, and about ten metres around, there were several pieces of Robert's companions, with limbs and heads everywhere, some of which had been crushed, not typical of lion attacks. The remains were so mixed up that it was impossible to tell who each one belonged to. Nothing more of Robert was found than a single hand and forearm. The official version of the events provides two hypotheses. The first was that the men were murdered by poachers, presumably ivory traffickers, but the marks on the bodies did not match up with bullets or knives. The second was that it was an animal who had killed Robert and his group. It was not explained what had happened to the crushed body parts, including a head. After several years, the case was closed without any definitive conclusion. However, there was one mysterious detail that the case left out. The rescue team had described that it looked like something huge and heavy had advanced on the camp. As I'm sure you know, Traveller, crocodiles and alligators can get quite large. The Mahamba is a good example of this. The Mahamba is a gigantic crocodilian creature that lives in the swampy areas of the Lake Likuala region in the Congo. Everything is bigger in the Congo, it would seem. The country is home to giant spiders like the Jabafofi, and is also host to a number of living dinosaurs and prehistoric creatures like the Congamato, the Kasai Rex, and of course, the infamous Mokele Mbembe. Along with these ancient giants who rule the untouched areas of Africa, we have the Mahamba, an enormous crocodile which some believe to be a surviving Sarcosuchus, which we are told went extinct around 93 million years ago. The Mahamba can reach lengths of up to 50 feet. While some say that the creature is a living Sarcosuchus, Others speculate that it is, in fact, a previously unknown freshwater relative of the Mosasaurus, a huge sea-dwelling monster, presumed to have gone extinct by the end of the Cretaceous period, presumed being the key word here. The Bobangi Aboriginals, who live in the area and have done for millennia, state with absolute conviction that the Mahamba is an animal unlike any other that they have seen. They have only compared it to the ordinary crocodile for the sake of comparison, and for the benefit of outsiders and explorers who ask for a description. It would seem that the Mahamba is not just a large crocodile, as many skeptics claim, but something more. With so many surviving dinosaurs living in the Congo, it could even be that the Mahamba is a surviving Spinosaur. The Spinosaurus lived in what is now North Africa, not far from the present-day Congo. Surviving Spinos may have made their way a little further southwest over the ensuing millions of years. The Mahamba was first reported by a Westerner in 1889 by a man named John Reinhardt Werner, an engineer working in what was then known as the Congo Free State. During the course of his work, he came across what he described as giant crocodiles many times, and suggested that the creatures were rather common in the area. Werner worked on a steamboat, the AIA. He stated that the enormous crocodilians common to the area were around 50 feet in length. How did he know this? 
the steamboat he worked on was 42 feet in length. With this as his point of reference, he was able to deduce the length of the monster crocs as they swam alongside the boat. On one occasion in the late 1880s, Werner and his assistant, a local boy, had made their way from the boat to a large sandbank to go duck hunting. Having shot one, and seeing that the rest of the ducks had taken flight and landed again past a low ridge of sand, they knelt down and then crawled along behind the ridge in order to get close enough to take another shot. Upon reaching a suitable vantage point, Werner raised his head and looked over the ridge. The ducks were still there, but they were not the only thing waiting for him. Less than 50 yards away, about halfway between he and the ducks, was what he described as the biggest crocodile he had yet seen. He reported that it was around 50 feet long, and the centre of the saw-like ridge on the top of its back was about four feet above the sand on which its belly rested. Having only a shotgun with him, and needing something more powerful in order to take down a creature of such a size, he sent his assistant away to fetch his rifle. As the assistant would be some time getting to the steamboat and then back again, he decided to stay where he was and observe the immense crocodilian creature. It didn't seem to mind his presence, either because it was asleep, or he was out of its line of sight. After a short while, some ducks landed close by, and they were within shooting range. Remembering that there was no food on board the AIA steamboat, he decided to aim and fire at another duck, which he successfully bagged. Upon firing the gun, however, the giant crocodile was startled, and its great sweeping tail sending sand flying far and wide, quickly scrambled towards the water, where it submerged itself and disappeared into the depths. Werner encountered the Mahamba once again, in 1888. While travelling along a river, the AIA suddenly hit a sandbank, in an area where the water seemed to only be about three feet deep. The engines were stopped, but the bow was embedded in the sand, which seemed to be heaving up and down beneath them, and the water was strangely disturbed. At first, Werner thought they had run into a hippo, but then realised that three feet of water wouldn't be enough to cover one entirely. It was at this point that he saw a gigantic crocodile, longer than the AIA, frantically rush across the bank and tumble back into the deep water. He stated that they must have hit the creature while it was underwater and jammed it into the sandbank, at which point it freed itself and made its escape. Werner was fortunate. He had witnessed the Mahamba several times and lived to talk about it. It's likely that there were a few explorers who did not, however. With so many witnesses coming forward and reporting animals of gigantic proportions and titanic prehistoric beasts still living in the deepest, darkest corners of the Congo, is it really fair to dismiss the Mahamba as make-believe? Freshwater crocodiles, saltwater crocodiles, alligators, caiman and gharils, they come in all different sizes. With the Nile crocodile reaching 20 feet in length, this shows that this type of creature can grow extremely large. So why couldn't it grow larger still? The American South is home to a wide array of wildlife. Some well documented and commonplace, others more mysterious and elusive. Deep in the woods of Alabama lurks a creature that many claim to have seen. You've heard of Bigfoot, you've heard of the Yeti, and you may know about some other ape-like cryptids, like the Orang Pendek or the Grassman. There are many undiscovered ape men out there, lurking in the wilderness. One that you may not have heard of, however, is the Alabama White Thang, which is no ordinary ape man. Descriptions of the Alabama White Thang vary. Several accounts describe it as being between seven and eight feet in height, and covered in thick white hair with glowing red eyes. Some say that it has no eyes at all. It's as if this cryptid is a type of ape or ape man from another world. There are also eyewitnesses who have reported that the creature resembles a white lion or a giant white sloth. The creature's howls are said to sound like a woman screaming. A foul odour, like that of a dead animal, 
permeates the area when the creature is close by. Despite its size, the Alabama White Thang can move extremely quickly, able to run at terrifyingly high speeds. Some have reported that even though it walks on two legs, it runs on all fours. If you plan to go camping in the Alabama wilderness, traveller, be sure to pack your running shoes. Sightings of the Alabama White Thang go back to the 1940s. The majority of sightings have occurred in Jefferson, Morgan and Etowah counties, usually in caves or drainage ditches in an area called Jones Valley. One witness, by the name of George Norris, came face to face with the creature in Enon Graveyard in Winston County. He had fallen asleep against a tree, and upon waking found that a bizarre, white creature was lying beside him. It didn't behave aggressively or attempt to bring the man any harm, but merely stared at him. He later stated that it had long, slick white hair and was semi-feline in appearance. While the Alabama White Thang does sound like a frightening creature, one that you would rather not come face to face with, there are no recorded White Thang attacks on humans. Is it a misunderstood Bigfoot-like creature, only wanting to be left in peace? Is it a curious alien visitor, only wanting to observe us, as evidenced by the case of George Norris? Nobody knows for certain. There are many strange things out there, Traveller, and the Alabama White Thang is definitely among them. Ireland The Great and Proud Celtic Nation When you think of Irish cryptids, you may think of the Dower Coo, or the Banshee. Out there, lurking within the wooded areas all across Ireland, however, is the Pooka. The Pooka, Irish for spirit or ghost, inhabits the wooded areas of Ireland. Traditionally considered to bring both good and bad fortune, they could either help or completely decimate rural and marine communities, depending on their mood. Pukai come in either dark coloured or white fur. The creatures are shapeshifters, and are able to take the form of several animals, including goats, cats, dogs and hares. They are said, however, to most often appear as a horse with black hair and glowing gold-coloured eyes. They are also able to take on a humanoid form, though this is something they're not quite as adept at doing. Whenever they attempt a human-like form, they usually give themselves away by retaining some animal features, such as a tail or animal-like ears. They are considered, generally, to either be beneficial to the local human population, or extremely menacing. Thomas Crofton Croker, the 19th century author of fairy legends and traditions of the south of Ireland, once collected a description from a boy living in Killarney, who told him that old people used to say that the Pookas were very numerous long ago, were wicked-minded, black-looking, bad things that would come in the form of wild cults with chains hanging about them. They were said to do much harm to unwary travellers. Being mischievous creatures, they are said to entice travellers, weary and sore from days, weeks or even months of continuous walking, to climb onto their back for a ride to relieve their poor, blistered and bloody feet. The Pooka, being a cruel and unpleasant creature, would then give the unsuspecting passenger a wild and terrifying journey at breakneck speed before dropping the unlucky person off at the exact spot at which they were picked up in the first place. Encounters such as these tend to occur in rural, isolated areas, far from settlements or villages. There are ways to protect yourself against this creature, however. If a person should find themselves riding on a puka, they may in fact be able to take control of it if they happen to be wearing sharp spurs on their boots. Using sharp spurs on the creature will force it to submit to the rider's will, 
and will allow him or her to steer the creature if they find themselves already on its back. Wearing sharp spurs will also prevent the traveller from being taken by the puka in the first place, as pukai are not terribly fond of being on the receiving end of trickery, or, naturally, sharp objects. While the puka has a reputation for mischievous behaviour, and for causing fear, harm or inconvenience to any humans it comes into contact with, they have also been known to be beneficial in their actions, and positive interactions between humans and pukai have been reported. There are old stories of pukai acting as guardians towards people who have found themselves in trouble. The puka may intervene to help those who have become lost in the woods, or are about to stumble upon a malevolent fairy or other hostile creature. In stark contrast with other forest creatures, such as fairies, who tend to keep themselves and their names a secret from humans, the puka will often appear before and introduce itself to the hapless human in need of help before offering its protection. There are several possible explanations for why this may occur. One is that there exist both malevolent and benevolent puka, with some choosing to do good and help those in need, and those with a more sadistic streak who wish to cause harm. Like all intelligent life forms, each member of this species will be an individual with their own thoughts, drives and personalities. If you ever find yourself lost in the woods in Ireland, you would best keep your fingers crossed that the puka you run into is a friendly one. Another theory is that when the puka offers its help to a lost and frightened traveller, it may be because of a dislike of other harmful creatures who populate the woods. Secret wars between Pukai and fairies could be happening right now, with bloody battles being waged in the shadows right under our noses. It could be that the Puka, who offers a helping hand to a lost and frightened human, wishes to prevent fairies or whichever creature it is at war with from gaining sustenance from its potential kill and therefore weakening the enemy. Or perhaps there are other reasons for this behaviour. I would welcome any theories of your own, Traveller. While some say that the Puka has a love of frightening and confusing humans but is mostly benevolent, others say that they are vampiric, bloodthirsty, evil creatures, and they have even been said to hunt down and kill humans before draining them of their blood and then devouring them. My advice? Visit Ireland. It's a beautiful country filled with wonderful people. But, whatever you do, avoid the woods. The year is 1977, and a ten-year-old boy by the name of Marlon Lowe is playing outside of his home in Lawndale, Illinois, USA. It's a summer evening like any other. His mother is outside keeping an eye on him and the other children, while his father is barbecuing. Everything is normal, when suddenly, little Marlon Lowe notices he has left the ground. His feet dangling below him, he sees the ground getting further and further away. He becomes aware of what feels like two clawed vice grips clutching his shoulders with eye-watering strength. His mother runs toward him, but not before the boy has been carried 30 feet or so across the front yard. She screams and charges at the flying beast, protection instincts taking full control. She succeeds in fending off the creature, and the boy drops to the floor. He then looks up to see… an enormous thunderbird. The Thunderbird, a large flying cryptid, said to be similar in appearance to a bird of prey, Historically, they have been said to live all across the Americas, from Alaska and Canada, down to Mexico, and similar stories have originated from other parts of the world as well. The Thunderbird, in this account from 1977, was reported by Marlon Lowe's mother, Ruth Lowe, along with several witnesses, to have an eight-foot wingspan, along with a six-inch hooked bill, a large black body, and three claws on each foot. 
The incident in Lawndale, Illinois, USA was not the first, however. Sightings of these creatures go back to antiquity and have a prominent place in ancient Native American legends. Tribes from all across the Americas have passed down stories of Thunderbirds, some of which talk about giant birds large enough to pluck whales out of the sea and carry them away to their nests. The old legends also state that while these gigantic birds were extremely dangerous and powerful animals, they were also seen as benevolent nature spirits, and they sometimes assisted the tribes in their search for food during periods of famine. Is it possible that the ancient tribes, all those thousands of years ago, were in fact capable of taming and training Thunderbirds? Like other birds of prey, they would have been intelligent hunters, and as we all know, it's possible to tame certain modern hunting birds, such as eagles or falcons. It may be possible that the Native Americans of antiquity were able to train Thunderbirds to help them as part of their hunting and gathering strategies. Sightings of these large bird-like creatures became known to the wider world when people began settling further west in the United States and Canada. One of the most famous reports is from 1890, where a large bird was shot and killed by two Arizona cowboys. Curiously, the surviving descriptions of this event state that the giant bird they killed had an alligator-like head and possessed no feathers. While many modern cryptozoologists consider thunderbirds to be giant birds of prey, a popular point of view among some is that they are actually surviving pterosaurs that have been misidentified or described as birds simply because witnesses were unfamiliar with the pterosaur's appearance and had no other way of explaining what they had seen. Thunderbird sightings are still being reported in recent and modern times. In the early 1940s, writer Robert R. Lyman spotted a Thunderbird sitting on a road near Cudersport, Pennsylvania. It soon took to the sky, spreading its 20-foot wingspan. In 1948, several witnesses along the Illinois-Missouri border sighted a condor-like bird about the size of a Piper Club aeroplane. In 1969, the wife of a Clinton County, Pennsylvania sheriff saw an enormous bird over Little Pine Creek. She said its wingspan appeared to be about as long as the creek was wide, about 75 feet. In 1970, several people in Pennsylvania saw the gigantic bird soaring towards the Jersey Shore. It was dark colored, and its wing spread was almost like that of an aeroplane. In September of 2001, a 19-year-old Pennsylvania native witnessed an enormous winged creature flying over Route 119 in the town of South Greensburg. The witness stated that they noticed what sounded like flags flapping in a thunderstorm and quickly looked up at the sky. Upon doing so, the eyewitness saw what appeared to be a gigantic bird with a wingspan estimated to be between 10 and 15 feet with a three-foot-long head. The witness told researcher Dennis Smeltzer that the huge black or greyish-brown bird passed over at about 50 or 60 feet. I wouldn't say it was flapping its wings gracefully, the witness told Smeltzer, but almost horrifically flapping its wings very slowly, then gliding above the passing big rig trucks. In May of 2013, again in the state of Pennsylvania, two friends were walking through the woods near Burn Athen Castle when they suddenly noticed an enormous bird sitting in a tree. One of the witnesses, by the name of Anthony, said, It was extremely loud, and I glanced up and saw a huge black bird. It was sitting above us, and we seemed to startle it. It flew about 100 feet to a nearby branch. Its wingspan was at least 10 feet, and judging how far it was, it looked to be around 4 feet tall. As you can see, Traveller, Thunderbird sightings go back thousands of years and are still being made today. While sightings aren't an everyday occurrence, they happen regularly enough to make their existence a very real prospect. 
Larger creatures tend to be fewer in number than smaller ones, and more spaced out, so it could be that the Thunderbird is just an incredibly and increasingly rare creature. But just because they're rare, doesn't mean that you'll never encounter one. Keep a close eye on your children while they innocently play outside, Traveller, lest they be carried away by the Thunderbird. The Black Demon is an enormous shark seen off the coast of Mexico's Baja California Peninsula. It is said to resemble a great white, except much larger, up to 60 feet in length, and is thought to weigh up to 100,000 pounds, over 45,000 kilograms. Its skin is midnight black, with piercing eyes that are somehow even darker. It overturns boats, attacks whales, and swallows entire groups of sea lions in a single bite, with its mouth wide enough to consume a whale. The legend of the Black Demon Shark has persisted for as long as people have entered the waters of the Gulf of California. In recent years, numerous sightings have been reported, primarily from local fishermen. One common theory is that the shark is actually a thought-to-be extinct megalodon, a prehistoric predator that could grow up to 60 feet itself, that we are told by mainstream science went extinct over two and a half million years ago. Another explanation is that the shark could actually be a hypermelanistic great white that has grown to its fullest adult potential. Melanism is an overabundance of melanin, the opposite of albinism, which can cause animals to have darker skin than usual, rather than lighter skin as seen in albinos. Could the black demon shark be one of these two hypotheses? Or rather, a whole different species altogether? In 1875, the crew of a ship named the HMS Challenger discovered a huge shark tooth near the Mariana Trench while charting the sea floor. The sample was similar in size to that of a megalodon. After being studied by experts, they concluded that it was only a mere 10,000 years old, much more recent than megalodons are said to have disappeared from our oceans. Dragons. They have been mentioned by every people, in every culture, in every part of the world, since the beginning of time. They came in many shapes and forms. In ancient China, they were revered as gods. In Europe, they were feared by all but a few brave knights. But did dragons actually exist? Are these legends and stories that have been passed down from generation to generation for tens of thousands of years just myths? Or are they indicative of a time when gigantic, flying reptilian animals actually existed on Earth? The dragon, at one time, was everywhere. Dragons appeared in paintings. They appeared in stories. They were a part of everyday life for our ancient ancestors. Human sacrifices, meant to appease the dragons whom people feared and worshipped, were common. Some people were born and raised specifically for that purpose, to one day be sacrificed to the dragon. Dragons have been given several different descriptions over the millennia. They seem to have come in a variety of colours and patterns, and are generally described as being large, reptilian, flying beasts, often with the ability to breathe fire. Some legends state that the dragon has wings which it used to take off and to propel itself through the air. The oldest known image of a western dragon appears in a hand-painted illustration from the bestiary M.S. Harley 3244, which was produced circa 1260 AD this dragon has two sets of wings, and its tail is longer than most modern depictions of dragons, but it clearly displays many of the same distinctive features. In the legends of ancient eastern countries, such as China, the dragon is said to instead be more of a serpentine, snake-like creature that can fly through the air by performing an undulating up-and-down motion, 
like how dolphins and whales swim, and without the need for wings. The eastern variations of these legends also mention the dragon's skin having a sparkling, magical quality, and are said to have a shining pearl or jewel embedded in their heads. Is it possible that possession of this supposed shining jewel could have been a hunting technique, similar to the anglerfish? For smaller dragons, this would certainly be an effective method of capturing magpies and other birds attracted to shiny objects. Dragons, being carnivorous, would most likely have made a meal out of human beings if such an opportunity arose. The cult of dragon worship, seen throughout the ages, would likely have come about through primitive peoples performing human sacrifices to appease the dragons. If they offered a human sacrifice to the dragon that lived nearby, it would be satiated and satisfied, meaning that it would not attack their settlement looking for a meal. Harvard University linguist and philologist Michael Witzel recently used a technique called phylogenetic analysis, which usually involves creating branching diagrams to represent the evolutionary history or relationship between different species that have developed from a common ancestor. Using this technique, Witzel discovered that dragon stories and legends go back 40,000 years, further back in time than anyone previously thought. It would seem that for as long as modern humans have been around, we have been aware of the existence of dragons. In these early days of human history, Dragons were likely to be a common sight when looking to the skies. The question we need to ask, however, is how exactly did dragons manage to fly? How did they even manage to take off in the first place? Dragons, in our various ancient legends, were said to be enormous creatures. How could an animal so gigantic be able to easily glide through the air without giving it a second thought? The answer is actually rather simple. In 1979, author Peter Dickinson published his book, The Flight of Dragons. He was impressed by how universal dragon legends were, coming from every corner of the globe and from all civilizations, which were completely isolated from each other. Dickinson believed that these stories must be based in reality and not merely the product of myths and fairy tales. The main problem that he had to grapple with, however, was the sheer size that dragons were meant to have been. He estimated, by studying medieval reconstructions, that dragons would weigh around 20,000 pounds when fully grown. To get off the ground, a creature of this size would need to have a wingspan of around 600 feet, about the height of the Seattle Space Needle in Washington State, USA. The easy thing to do would be to dismiss flying creatures of this size as fantasy and nothing more. However, it is in fact a strong possibility that a creature of such an immense size could have existed. Peter Dickinson, in his book The Flight of Dragons, talks about a chance viewing of the Hindenburg crash footage on television. Upon seeing this footage, a thought struck him. He said that, The Hindenburg was not just a very big machine that flew, it was a machine that could fly only because it was very big. Dragons could fly because most of their bodies were hollow and filled with lighter than air gas. Dragons needed an enormous body to hold enough gas to provide lift for the total weight of the beast. Dragons did not need enormous wings, because they only used them for propulsion and manoeuvring. Dragons breathed fire because they had to. It was a necessary part of their specialised mode of flight. Peter Dickinson, in his book The Flight of Dragons, had hit upon a groundbreaking theory for the existence of dragons on Earth thousands of years ago. Being as large as they were, they would need to be hollow and filled with lighter than air gas. They would also need to breathe fire somehow, as it was necessary for their mode of flight. 
He theorized that dragons were in fact the descendants of large, fast-moving carnivorous dinosaurs like the Tyrannosaurus rex. Like the infamous Mokele Mbembe, which makes its home in the African country of the Congo, the dragon could have been a relative of the dinosaurs from those prehistoric times, a few of which managed to survive the extinction level event that killed most of their kind. Over the ensuing tens of millions of years, the T-Rex could have evolved the ability to fly. This isn't too far from the currently accepted scientific theory of modern day birds being the descendants of dinosaurs. Along with gaining wings, they would have also developed huge chambered stomachs that they filled with hydrogen gas. The hydrogen would be formed from a mixture of hydrochloric acid in the gut and calcium, which would be gained from the bones of its prey. The hydrogen in the dragon's stomach, once expelled through the mouth and coming into contact with oxygen, would be extremely flammable. This would explain the dragon's most iconic attribute, its fiery breath. To gain lift, the dragon would fill its gas bag stomach. To descend, it would burn it off by breathing it out. The fiery breath could, of course, also be used as a weapon in territorial disputes with other dragons, and as a weapon of destruction against human settlements, should it feel the need to do so. A similar technique can be seen in the modern-day bombardier beetle, which fires boiling jets of chemicals at its enemies, chemicals produced in separate glands in the beetle's body which do not reach such high temperatures until they come into contact with oxygen. If the bombardier beetle has such an ability, then a similar talent could have also been present in other creatures throughout history. Most animals produce stomach acid, many animals produce water, and the majority of animals produce gas. Isn't it possible that a living creature, like the dragon, could biologically produce fire? So with all this in mind, the question that would occur to most people is that if dragons exist, or existed at one point in history, then where are the fossils? Dinosaur fossils have been found, but so far no dragon fossils are known to have been found or exist. To say that dragons didn't exist because no remains have been found would be convenient and easy. However, a much more compelling theory has been put forward. When dragons are alive, their stomachs would have a thick mucus lining that would keep their hydrochloric acid in check and prevent it from eating away at them from the inside. Once the dragon has died, however, the mucus lining would no longer be produced. This would allow the hydrochloric acid to begin eating away at the dragon's carcass, eventually digesting itself. Once the acid has completely eaten away at the dead dragon, there would be no trace left, no bones, and hence, no fossils. Today's cryptid lives deep in the forests of the Congo. The Jabar Fofi, also known as the Congolese giant spider, is a type of giant arachnid said to measure up to four feet in size, their body the circumference of a basketball. They are said to be brown in colour and are highly venomous, possessing large fangs with venom potent enough to kill a man. Most tales describe them digging a shallow tunnel underneath tree roots and camouflaging it with a large screen of leaves. They will then weave their almost invisible webs between this burrow and a nearby tree, stringing the whole area with a network of trip lines. When an oblivious animal, or even human, trips the line, alerting the spider, it will quickly emerge from its hole and chase the victim into the webs. Its eggs are a pale yellow-white and shaped like peanuts. Natives claim the hatchlings are bright yellow with a purple abdomen. Their coloration becomes darker and more brown as they mature. Some of the peoples, indigenous to the regions in the Congo where the Jabar Fofi has been seen, assert that the spider was once quite common, but has since become very rare. 
The native peoples of the Congo tell stories of the giant Congolese spiders entering their villages, killing livestock and taking away small animals, or even children. The very first sighting of the Jabar Fofi by a Western observer was in the 1890s near Lake Nyasa, during which a missionary named Arthur John Symes and his men said they came upon one of the creatures. His men got themselves each tangled in an enormous web, and two giant spiders which were two and four feet in length, presumably one male and one female, came out of nowhere and attacked them. Symes was bitten, but managed to escape after shooting one with his pistol. He subsequently developed symptoms including a deathly pallor, severe chills, swelling around the bite area, and became delirious before falling into unconsciousness. He ultimately succumbed to the effects, and died. The fullest account by Westerners appears in a cryptozoological book by George Eberhardt. On page 204, Eberhardt relates the terrifying experience of an English couple travelling through a region of jungle in what is now called the Congo. R. K. Lloyd and his wife were motoring in the Belgian Congo in 1938 when they saw a large object crossing the trail in front of them. At first, they thought it was a cat or monkey, but they soon realised it was a spider with legs nearly three feet. Cryptozoologist William J. Gibbons has hunted for what some think may be a living Congolese dinosaur called Mokele Mbembe. Upon his third expedition in search of the creature, he came upon natives who related their experiences with giant spiders. He shared his experience with readers upon his return to Canada. On this third expedition to equatorial Africa, I took the opportunity to inquire if the pygmies knew of such a giant spider, and indeed they did. They speak of the Jabar Fofi, which is a giant or great spider. They describe the spider that is generally brown in colour, with a purple mark on the abdomen. They grow to quite an enormous size, with a leg span of at least five feet. The giant arachnids weave together a lair made of leaves similar in shape to a traditional pygmy hut, and spin a circular web, said to be very strong, between two trees with a strand stretched across a game trail. These giant ground-dwelling spiders prey on the diminutive forest antelope, birds and other small game, and are said to be extremely dangerous, not to mention highly venomous, Gibbons states. The spiders are said to lay white, peanut-sized eggs in a cluster, and the pygmies give them a wide berth when encountered, but have killed them in the past. The giant spiders were once very common, but are now a rare sight. Many of the natives describe the spiders as once being numerous, but now a vanishing species. Possibly due to rainforests being converted to farmland, driving the spiders away from their natural habitats.